We're continuing today through the Gospel of Luke, and we are in the 20th chapter of Luke at verse 20, reading from that point through chapter 21, verse 4. It is the, the day of questions in the last week of the Lord's life. Luke 20, 20 says to us, and all through this, by the way, we're looking at the theme, the magnetism of Jesus. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius whose icon and epigraph are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he said there in public and astonished by his answer, they became silent. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. So we'd all say, thank the Lord. <laughs> now then at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, Rabbi, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. Then Jesus said to them, how is it that they say the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? While all the te people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. When I was in the old city of Jerusalem a few weeks ago, we were coming out of the bazaar area, walking toward Jaffa Gate, and just at the end of the bazaar area, we saw a gentleman whose face uh, we recognized. J Jewel and I were just alone together, and uh, we began talking to him and uh, uh, really realized then who he was. He had been our first tour guide when we were in Israel almost 10 years ago. His name, by trade, Walking Michael. And I see Florence Christie of Jerusalem here, and I know you know Walking Michael rather well. We asked him how he was doing, and he said, well, he had uh, just retired a short time ago from being tour guide. and." Then he said, you know, you wouldn't want to take a tour with me today anyway. He said, I'm a different person than I was years ago. And we asked him how that was so. And he said, well, I've really become an agnostic. He said, when you live in this city of religion, he said, ultimately, you come to hate religion. He said, I think it's all just terrible. He said, they don't get along. Nobody gets along with anybody else. And he said, I'm an agnostic. I don't believe in anything. 
And I realized what he was talking about because that week in the news in Jerusalem, the Israeli police had had to be called down to the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, the church that commemorates the place where Christ was born, to break up a potential fight which had occurred the year before at Christmas time between a group of Armenian priests and a group of Greek Orthodox priests over who had the right to wash one of the walls in the church of the Nativity. And he pointed that out. And he also pointed out that in the Jewish religion itself, the minister of the interior had resigned that week because he refused to validate an order from the Supreme Court of Israel which had mandated that a Baptist woman from De Texas who had converted to Judaism under a reformed rabbi, that her conversion be recognized as valid. And since the Orthodox don't recognize reformed conversions, the minister of interior and Orthodox resign rather than validate the conversion. And then when you're in Jerusalem, you see also the conflict even in, in the Muslim faith between the Sunnis and the Shiites. And any cursory hearing of the news in Iran and Iraq tells us that these religious people are killing one another. And that Ayatollah Khomeini is sending 12 and 13 year old boys to the front with cardboard keys around their neck in, because they are on jihad, holy war, which means when they die they go straight to paradise and when they get up there all they have to do is show the key and they get straight in. It's no wonder that many, many people in this world are turned off on religion. And it's not hard to understand where Walking Michael was coming from. We tried to witness to him and to share our faith and we just hope that a good word was left with him about looking at Jesus rather than at religion. I think many youth today and many people in American society are turned off by the trappings of institutional Christianity and institutional religion, of the phoniness of many people who claim to wear the name of Christ, phony miracle workers and some snake oil TV preachers and others who simply seem to live as parasites off the body of Christ and magic workers. The older I get, the less I like religion, but the more I like Jesus. He somehow stands out as different and separate and attractive and magnetic. And I like him as I watch what I see him doing in the day of questions here that is presented to us in Luke 20. We dealt with the first question that was asked him last week, the question of authority put to him by the people who were in authority. And now we pick up the next question that is asked him, verses 20 through 26, the question of patriotism. Matthew and Mark tell us that the people who came to ask him this question about taxes were actually the Herodians and the Pharisees. It's like having the radical right wing and the radical left wing get together to trap somebody in the center. And so they come, the Herodians who were for the authority of Rome and the Pharisees for whom paying the coin that bore Caesar's image was anathema and heresy. They come to trap him. Their goal was to get him to make a public remark which would do one of two things. If he owned the taxes, then it would set the crowds against him and he was popular with the crowds. If he said don't pay the taxes, then he becomes in jeopardy of the governor, the governor there being the Roman governor, Pilate, under whose authority he would be indicted and tried for sedition if he said one shouldn't pay taxes. They come to Jesus disguised. And Jesus is not impressed with flattery, although they flatter him. I must tell you in my own life, I have done some foolish things because people have flattered me. But I, again, the magnetism of Jesus is that nothing turns his head. And neither does he dodge the question. He will tackle it straight on. The question that faces him, the matter of paying taxes to the government, is not nearly as troublesome to us as American Christians as it is troublesome to Christians elsewhere in the world. And as Jesus opens his mouth every time he teaches, he knows that his words must be applied by Christians across the centuries under a tremendous variety of cultures and governments and societies. And so whatever word he speaks must have universal application. In America, we don't have so much a problem with taxes, other than perhaps cheating on our taxes, because we have in this country not only a great love for our country, but we have a great love for our form of government. And so when Christ calls us to respect that government and to obey that government and to pay taxes to that government, we may not have the problems that people do who are Christians in the Soviet Union or in Nicaragua or in Cuba or in China. Speaking of paying taxes, it is coming up on that time of year. 
I'm reminded of the man who wrote the Internal Revenue Service an anonymous letter and enclosed a cashier's check for $5,000. And he said, encloses my check to pay for taxes that I cheated on in past years. My conscience has been bothering me. If my conscience still bothers me, I will send you the balance I owe. <clears throat> Jesus is living at a time when the zealots were advocating political and violent revolution against Rome. They would ultimately succeed in their objectives. They would foment a revolution which would be ruthlessly crushed. For a Jew to pay taxes to the Romans would be equivalent to an American paying taxes to an occupying Russian authority and power. We would not like it. And yet Jesus says, give to Caesar, give to the government what is the government's, and give to God what is his. Whose image, Jesus says, does this coin bear? Give that which bears the image of Caesar to Caesar. There has been much talk in the third world today about liberation theology. I have ministered in the, in the third world and, and it seems to me that when you are in a country where there is no middle class, where there is just the few that are rich, that in many ways and many times exploit the tremendous mass of people that are poor and uneducated and without any kind of medical assistance, or even when you're in a Marxist country where you have the few bureaucratic elite and the masses that are poor, you sense some of this struggle for uh, why, why can't one just advocate the violent overthrow of the government? And there have been so-called Christian theologians in our day that have advocated a liberation theology and have deemed it appropriate that in the cause of human justice and social betterment that Christians resort to picking up rifles and guns and hand grenades and overthrowing a totalitarian government, be it on the right or left, in the name of Jesus and killing all the oppressors. That is a pressing problem for Christians in the third world. And we see here Jesus once and for all in his own teaching laying to rest the issue of liberation theology by saying to his church, give to the government what is in the likeness of the government. The best the government can do is put the face of its leaders on its coins or on its currency. Give to the government what is external to it. But you, you as a person, are made in the image of God. Give what is made in the image of Caesar back to Caesar. But give what is made in the image of God back to God. If you must give the government your external property, give it. But give your life to God. And in doing that, by the way, Jesus is saying, never give to the government your heart. Never give to the government your absolute loyalty. Never give to the government your worship. And if the government will require that of you, as has happened in some countries in the world today, then Christians must choose to be loyal to God and lay down their life in suffering and in persecution and in imprisonment rather than give that life which belongs to God because it is in his image. Pay the taxes, Jesus says, and give God what is really his. That sets up the third question that is asked him on the week of questions, and that is a question about the afterlife, verses 27 through 40. It's one that I think the Sadducees had rehearsed and probably tried out a few times to tease the Pharisees with because they were obviously cynical about the idea of resurrection. They, uh, the Sadducees did not believe in any part of the Old Testament other than the first five books, the law, the Torah. They held that the doctrine of resurrection was not taught within the first five books of the Bible. They did not believe in spirit, in the spirit or in angels. And uh, they come to Jesus on the basis of an Old Testament practice articulated in the 25th chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 5 and 6 which was designed to protect in that uh, agricultural society the property rights of a widow. What if she died and she did not, it was impossible for her as a widow to have a title in her own name. It would have been in her husband's name or in her son's name. And so there was an occasion provided within the Old Testament law that if her husband died and she were childless, that the elder brother of the husband or a brother of the husband could marry her and should and must marry her and that the first child born to that union would be the heir of the deceased first husband and of course while that child was coming to majority then the widow would have a secure place in which to live and to stay and be provided for. 
It was, from the Mosaic Law's point of view, an act of mercy for this to happen. Now here were these Sadducees who get this story of this lady who had had the misfortune of not having seven brides for seven brothers, but one bride for seven brothers. And uh, religious people, by the way, that are far from the heart of God, can be extremely callous in their attitude toward other people's hurt. So she becomes a theological arguing point rather than a word of sympathy for the seven times she'd had to go to the grave. Not a word of pity for her. It's a rather cynical question which is put to Jesus which showed the disdain of the Sadducees altogether for this idea of resurrection. When Jesus answered it, we often skip over the first part of his answer, but the first part of his answer is very important. He says, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. In saying that, Jesus distanced himself from groups within his own day and who were ascetics, who saw that the single life was superior to marriage and celibacy was God's highest and best rule and therefore segregated themselves into monastic communities and regarded that as the single best way to please God. In the New Testament, Paul will make an argument that the person who is single has more time to serve God, but he will not make the argument that somehow marriage is God's second choice. Jesus says simply, in this age, God has ordained and allowed the giving of marriage and the being married. His second part of his answer relates, however, to the afterlife. Jesus does not dodge the question that has been asked him, and he flat out endorses the doctrine of the resurrection, and he adds two details. He adds the detail that there will be no marriage in heaven. Um, now I know to young people who are planning on getting married, that's a rough doctrine. Say, wow, I'm not sure I want to go to heaven if I can't be married in heaven, if I die before I get a chance to get married on earth. On the other hand, there are married people here who may be married for some time that are glad that there is no marriage in heaven. I don't know. <laughs> All as I know is a God who is the perfect creator. If he's made heaven, it's going to be better than earth. And if anything can be better than marriage, I guess God is the one that can make it better. So we have to leave that in his hands. But then the Lord goes on to add another detail and says that in heaven, in the resurrected life, we'll be like the angels. Not like the angels in the sense that we haven't had a free will and all this sort of thing, but we'll be like the angels in the sense that we will never die. You see, one of the reasons why God placed marriage on earth is for the perpetuation of the human race. Because within a hundred years, all of us in this room, if the Lord tarries, are going to be gone. And unless the human race keeps reproducing, there will be no human race. The angels do not need marriage because there is no need for reproduction. God directly created the angels. So the Lord says that in the resurrection, there is going to be no need for procreation since we will be children of the resurrection, granted everlasting life, unceasing life. We will exist forever, he says, as the children of the resurrection. And I think that's a tremendous thing. I'm looking forward to a life that's everlasting, but not just to a life that has all kinds of quantity to it. I'm looking forward to a life that has all kinds of quality to it. To the surprise of the Sadducees, Jesus grounds his argument in the belief in the resurrection, not from the prophets, which the Sadducees did not accept, but he grounded it right from the Torah, from the five books of the law, which they did accept and said right within them, there is the doctrine of the resurrection. And he quotes from verse 37, but in the account of the bush. That's an interesting way of introducing Exodus 3. Jesus does not say, now go back in your Bible to Exodus 3. And the reason, of course, he can't say that is in those days there was no chapter and verse division of the scripture. So people knew the scripture by a title that was given to it. So it reminds us that it's from the account of the bush. And what is that account? It's the account where Moses is told to take off his shoes because he is on holy ground. And God is calling him to go into Egypt and lead his people out. And Moses protests and finally he wants to know who God is. And God says to him, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus, in quoting this, wants us to pay deliberate attention to the verb tense that God uses to Moses. Namely, that God does not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for had the past tense been used, then it could infer 
that Abraham or Isaac or Jacob had only once lived and now we're no more. But when God uses of himself the present tense, it means that not only he, God, continues to exist, but Abraham is existing yet in his presence. Isaac is yet existing. Jacob is yet existing. As Jesus says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I am attracted to the magnetism of a Lord who holds out before me the prospect of eternal life, of being accounted worthy through his own death and resurrection to partake in the resurrection eternal. Sometime in the next hundred years, I'm going to need that application of Christ's power, and so are you. The fourth question that emerges is the question of ancestry, verses 41 through 44. It is not a question that is asked Jesus, but it is a question he asks those around him. They are through asking him questions he has laid them to rest. How is it that they say the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord. David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Now that sounds like a riddle. Jesus intended it to be a riddle because the one thing that was not being expected about the identity of the Messiah was that there would be that divine nature to him that belonged to the Lord. It was expected that the Messiah would be David's son, David's descendant, a ruler who would physically rule and sit upon the throne of Israel and overthrow the yoke of Rome. Yet Jesus is saying the Messiah is something more than David's son. For David himself, in Psalm 110, calls him Lord, calls the Messiah Lord. Obviously, Jesus answers the question, how can he be his son and yet be his Lord? Jesus was answered by saying, I am both. I am on the human side, David's son. And on the divine side, I am David's Lord. David was praying to me before, centuries before, I came into earth as his descendant. The question, quite naturally, was one which could not be answered because as yet people did not understand the dual nature of Christ, how he was fully God and fully man. The Lord does, in quoting Psalm 110, however, say that the Lord, that is God the Father, said to my Lord, that is Christ the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And later in the New Testament, when Psalm 110 is being quoted, it is being used to the fact that Christ now in the heavens is sitting on his throne until that day when all enemies have been put under his feet as a footstool. This scripture never really meant a great deal to me in terms of visualizing it until I was in the Cairo Museum going through the King Tut exhibit. And that's a, just a monumental exhibit, the wealth and glory of this 18-year-old pharaoh who in the course of uh, just a few years had compiled such wealth is mind-boggling. You, you wonder about Ramses II who died at the age of 99 and what his tomb must have been like. But one of the things that is in the Tut collection is the throne, the chair upon which Tut sat, and also the footstool that went with the chair on which he placed his feet. And it is a, it is a beautiful, um, bron uh, not bronze, but metal cast footstool that has been hammered out and beautiful artwork has emerged on it. And the footstool actually, and this is the case with all the pharaohs, the footstool has on it the engraved representations of the enemies of that pharaoh during his lifetime and reign and administration. So you'll see very distinctly the form of a Chaldean, the form of an Assyrian, or the form of a Babylonian, or the form of an Ethiopian, and they are all engraved on the footstool to symbolize when the pharaoh sat back in his chair and put his feet on his footstool that his feet were resting on his enemies. They were subject to him. And David, familiar with that practice in his psalm, says, one day all the enemies of God Almighty will simply serve as a decorative footstool for the Lord, the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He will reign 
until all enemies are under his feet. And in Jesus Christ, we're magnetically attracted to the one who has the highest title that has ever been given to anyone in the human race, Son of God, Lord, Son of David. The final issue which our scripture today addresses is not a test question, but is instead an issue, an issue of hypocrisy versus genuine spirituality. When Jesus is done with the time of questioning, he then directly takes on the religious leadership and their hypocrisy and notes that these teachers of the law like to walk around with ostentation in flowing robes, to be greeted in marketplaces, in the most important seats in synagogues, and the places of honor at banquets, but they devour widows' houses. That is, these rabbis should, as rabbis, have had a trade in order to produce an income, but instead they ingratiated themselves to women who had the means to support the lifestyle to which they had become accustomed, and they wound up ultimately getting a hold of their property and making a show of their religiosity by lengthy prayers. Several things that could be noted about hypocrisy. One thing I've known about hypocrisy is that it is always easier to see hypocrisy in others than in ourselves. Back at Evangel College this week, my alma mater, where I almost drowned myself in a sea of nostalgia, <clears throat> I, uh, I so remembered how as a college student I could spot all the hypocrites. And uh, since that was denominational headquarters, uh, there were a few specific ones that I could clearly identify more readily in my mentality with the scribes and the Pharisees than with Jesus of Nazareth. But interestingly enough, I was always rougher on them than I was on myself. I think that Jesus is probably the only person who can really truly and authentically criticize hypocrisy because there is no double standard in his own life. But certainly it is easy to cast the moat out of somebody else's alleys when there may be a log in our own, as the Lord has said. But another thing that needs to be said about hypocrisy is that it really turns people away from God. And Jesus knew that, and it's why he came down so hard on these people who were religious leaders. I have seen people like a walking Michael use religious people as an excuse, and I think sometimes legitimately because they've never seen the real authentic Jesus, just simply seen some inadequate representations and walk away from the Lord. I was talking yesterday with a person who's very close to me, and they were recounting the fact that their son and wife, uh, their son has had a very turbulent and checkered uh, kind of spiritual commitment and only in the last few years seemingly was getting things back together and was faithfully involved in a church and now that church has just gone through a great argument and now for the last three months this son and his wife and their three young children are staying at home on Sundays. Say, so we're turned off by people in the church who talked about love and acted like the devil. I think we need to remember that sin doesn't occur just in the gutter, but sin occurs in the highest aspirations and noblest ideals of man, which are the desire to worship God. The devil fell through pride and not through sensuality. He can penetrate even our worship and our religious faith. And we need to be super careful in our own life that we do not have a stone of stumbling in our life that causes somebody else to trip up because our, the reality of our profession is different than the, what we're actually saying with our lips. Then one other thing about hypocrisy that is here, and I think the Lord recognizes it, that there were always so-called be rel religious professionals, people who prey off their followers, who have all the trappings of religion, know a lot of religious things, can uh, show themselves erudite on theology, and talk in circles above everyone else and all the time use that religiosity to pad their own wallet and to make a living, living off the naive widow's houses. This happens as well in the body of Christ today. There must always be in the part of those who serve the Lord in a public role an understanding that the Lord is just as concerned with how we do things as what our end results are. We can have really noble goals, 
We can be really wanting to do something wonderful in the kingdom of God. But in getting that job done, and especially as it pertains to the raising of funds, Christian leadership needs to be extremely careful that the way we get the money is as pure as the way we spend it. That the means are as good as the goals. Because the Lord is every much concerned with how we get there as what we do when we've got there. And he tags the Pharisees and the scribes for being people who are not concerned with means, with how we arrive at something. But then the Lord changes over and he sits at the temple and watches people putting in their gifts. In the temple of this period, this called the second temple, the temple that Herod had rebuilt, there was an area in which there were 13 large trumpet-like boxes for the receptacles of gifts. And they each had a designated fund. There were 13 designated funds for the temple. Some to buy oil, some to, you know, buy wood for the burning and the sacrifices and the like. So you could choose which one of these 13 trumpet kinds of things you would put your money in. Jesus watches people coming with lavish gifts. And then he sees this little widow come who puts in two small copper coins. The Greek word is lepta. It's the smallest coinage of the day. It was worth maybe a sixteenth of a cent. And uh, some think that, in fact, in giving an offering to the temple, a lepta was such a small coinage that it was forbidden to give only one. If you were going to give a gift that small, at least you had to give two. Two wonderful things Jesus does about this woman. One thing that he does is he values, who is a, he values her as a person. He picks her out of the crowd as an example of what he approves in life. She is very significant to him. She is insignificant to the people who are counting the funds and watching what's going on. But to Jesus, she is the most significant person there. And then I thought in my own life of some of the little old ladies that I have seen following Jesus, whom the world doesn't think a whole lot of, and who maybe the church at times doesn't think a whole lot of. I think of preaching in churches in Eastern Europe where 75% of the audience was women that were all kind of wrapped up in their scarves, older women, 65 and beyond. They were in the church. And we from the West come and say, where are all the young people? And forget that in a time of persecution, in a time of danger for the church, many times the young people leave or check out and all that's left are the little old ladies, and you see this in pictures of the church in Eastern Europe and in Russia, when the fires of the faith have been banked, then there's these little old people that are left, and the world regards them as naive and simple, and they're all wrapped up in giving their money to the Lord and their prayers to God. And so finally the government leaves them alone and says, oh, what's the faith of a few old women? That can't hurt us. We'll just let them go to church until they die off. But what happens is those little old ladies pray. And before the government knows what happens, God has brought a whole new young generation to pass and the church hasn't died because in the time when the fires of faith were banked, they were keeping it alive and spreading the sparks to another generation. And God values every one of them. God values all his little old ladies and sees them all as significant. And Jesus gives us a text right out of his own life that lets us know his opinion of people whom even the church may regard sometimes as insignificant. They're not insignificant. No, there is no such thing as an insignificant person to Jesus of Nazareth. And then another wonderful thing that Jesus does is he values the gift that this lady brings. Now anyone who's ever raised funds or been in a capital fund drive knows that you value the large donors. If you're building an institution, you want to get a building named after them. Give me a million dollars, I'll name this building after you. Give us 50 million and we'll name the whole campus after you, you know. 
walk down in Hogue Hospital, for example, which is a worthy charitable organization in our community, and you see on the halls the names of the benefactors, the names of the founders, the names of the friends of Hogue Hospital, all different degrees of giving based on dollar amounts as to whether you're a benefactor, a friend, or just a donor. And uh, here's a little lady that wouldn't have got her name on a wall. If they were putting plaques up in a church, she would have never got a plaque. She wouldn't have had a stained glass window. By the way, it's one of the reasons why in this church, at least as long as I'm pastor, you'll never see anybody's name on anything because I think the Lord forbids that kind of recognition. Um, anyway, that's a side point. I could really get in trouble real quick. Jesus simply tells us that he values the proportion more than he values the amount. From a human point of view, we look at the amount and we say, wow. But Jesus says, no, it's not the amount, it's the proportion. And look at what this lady did. She gave everything she had. So obviously she's poor. She's down to a sixteenth of a cent. She's on her last. And we could even argue rationally that she shouldn't have done it. And all I know is that the God who makes the oil and the widow's little cooking pot keep going is somehow able to take care of his widows who give to him from a whole heart. But Jesus said she gave everything, and I'm attracted to the magnetism of a Lord who has the courage not to be governed by the size of a gift, but by the size of the person's heart who gives it. The magnetism of Jesus. He draws forth our highest loyalty. He has the chief authority. He draws forth our highest loyalty in that he asks us to give back to him what is made in his image, namely our life. His magnetism lifts me into the age to come by the resurrection of life eternal. His magnetism presents himself to me as the person with the highest rank and title who has ever lived. His magnetism to me stands against all that is false and phony in religion. And his magnetism stands with all those who serve him from a whole heart. The spies of Luke 20, 21, who slipped into the crowd to ask him a question, made an insincere comment. They meant it as insincere, but truer words were never spoken than the words these flatterers gave to him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. That magnetism of Jesus has drawn us here today and will ever draw us to him all through life. He speaks and teaches what is right and he teaches the way of God in accordance with the truth. Lord, our ears have been blessed because we have heard you and our lives are enriched because of your presence and our life is changed because you've come in to life and life in the hereafter is changed because you are present. Lord Jesus, for every one of us in here I pray that allegiance to you would be our highest loyalty are there any friends here today who have not made you the chief person in their life, the Lord of their life? I pray that the magnetism of your Lordship would overwhelm their hearts in these moments as we pray, and that from the heart their own knee would bow to you as the Lord. I thank you for the promise that you give us and the surety that you give us that in the age to come we will be sons and daughters of the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that there's a future for us in 2087 and in 3087 and in 10,087. Thank you, Lord, for the life you offer us. And thank you, Lord, for standing always for what is right and pure. Help us in life, Lord, to make the way we live just as pure as our goals to forsake the cutting of shortcuts, to put off untruth and conniving and hypocrisy, and to serve you simply with a whole heart. Let us have the faith of this little widow 
who loves you and your work so much that she has got everything committed to you, not just a part of her heart, not just half her heart, but all her heart and life out of her whole living given to you. Help us to be that kind of people, Lord, who give the whole proportion to you. Thank you for your presence with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.